Good afternoon. My name is Mark Katz, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm so pleased to welcome you here to the Wheel Lecture on American Citizenship with the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. Thank you to our wonderful student choir for setting the stage for tonight's event. Song is, of course, entirely appropriate for this space, Miser Auditorium, part of UNC's vibrant Department of Music. Over the decades, some of the world's finest musicians have graced this stage. But I want to mention a different kind of event that took place right here more than half a century ago. It was on May 9, 1960, that a dynamic and controversial religious leader from the South gave a speech called The Struggle for Racial Justice, a title that is as relevant today as it was 57 years ago. The speaker's name was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I believe that Dr. King's presence and legacy will be keenly felt in this room today. In a moment, my distinguished colleague, Theodore Shaw, will introduce our speaker. First, I want to say a few words about the Institute for the Arts and Humanities and the Wheel Lecture. The mission of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities is to empower UNC's faculty to reach their full potential as scholars, teachers, and leaders. The Institute supports this mission through its Faculty Fellows Program, its Academic Leadership Program, as well as through public events that take up the important issues of the day, such as today's lecture. We at the IAH are proud to be the stewards of the Wheel Lecture on American Citizenship. The IEH has hosted this event since the year 2000, but the series is much older. The first Wheel Lecture was delivered in 1915 by William Howard Taft, who had served as both President and Chief Justice of the United States. Over the next century, a series of important figures gave the Wheel Lecture, among them Eleanor Roosevelt, Jimmy Carter, Julian Bond, Cornell West, and most recently, John Huntsman and Barney Frank. The Wheel Lecture is just one of many contributions to the university by the Wheel family. Brothers Henry, Solomon, and Herman Wheel left Germany sometime around 1859 and set up a business as wagon peddlers in Goldsboro, just about 90 miles southeast of Chapel Hill. And by the way, Reverend Barber makes his home in Goldsboro as well. Ever since they arrived in this country, the Wheel family has embraced a tradition of philanthropy and community engagement. Wheels have been elected officials as well as early leaders in women's suffrage, civil rights, and historic preservation. Wheels have donated funds and, lands to, and land to create parks, a library, a synagogue, a theater, a hospital, and much more. They have also served as trustees at UNC Chapel Hill and have supported our medical, information, and library science and business schools. For this and much more, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is deeply grateful. We have several members of the extended Wheel family here with us today, and I'd like to take, us a, mo and I'd like to take a moment to thank them. Thank you. I've asked Professor Theodore Shaw to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight. Theodore M. Shaw is the Julius L. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Civil Rights at the University of North Carolina School of Law. Professor Shaw was the fifth Director, Counsel, and President of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. In 1990, Mr. Shaw left LDF to join the faculty of the University of Michigan Law School where he taught constitutional law, civil procedure, and civil rights. While at Michigan, he played a key role in initiating a review of the law school's admissions practices and policies, and served on the faculty committee that promulgated the admissions program that was upheld by the US Supreme Court in 2003 in Grutter versus Bollinger. Mr. Shaw's legal career began as a trial attorney in the honors program of the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division in Washington, D.C. In 
where he worked from 1979 to 1982. Mr. Shaw has testified on numerous occasions before Congress and before state and local legislatures. His human rights work has taken him to Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America. His, sorry, Mr. Shaw served on the Obama transition team after the 2008 presidential election as team leader for the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Shaw to the podium. Good evening. I'm reminded uh, by my wife periodically that some years ago when civil rights lawyers were working to extend the expiring provisions of the Voting Rights Act, there was a, an event at the world famous Apollo Theater uh, and Stevie Wonder was uh, uh, supporting that extension. And so they asked me to speak before Stevie Wonder performed. <laughs> Not a good position to be in. Uh, and I, was, I said I was very clear on that occasion that uh, folks did not want to hear some lawyer go on about uh, legislation. Uh, they wanted to hear Stevie Wonder. I feel like I'm in a similar position tonight. <laughs> Um, so let me say a, a few words uh, of introduction to Reverend Barber uh, because this is a singular honor for me to introduce him this evening and I'm grateful for this opportunity. As I was thinking about what I could say about him since you already know what you need to know uh, to prep you to hear him, uh, I felt like, uh, nonetheless, uh, I would make the comparison you just heard uh, because many people have talked about Reverend William J. Barber as our time's Martin Luther King Jr. I certainly have thought about him in that way, and I do. Um, but another part of me uh, is somewhat hesitant to think about him in that way, uh, in part because Martin Luther King, now that he has been safely dead for several decades, has been hijacked uh, by those who were opposed to his agenda while he lived and who would oppose him if they were alive today. Uh, it's not that they can change his legacy, uh, but uh, again, my, my life partner, my wife, showed me a post the other day where someone took his youngest daughter to task for saying something about uh, contemporary race issues and activism, the controversies we're dealing with today. And this person chastised her uh, for making what he thought was uh, a, an inappropriate statement. And we thought, what, what gall? Now, as it just so happens, I had the honor, had the honor of knowing the King family. Yolanda King, his oldest daughter, who passed away tragically a few years ago, was a dear friend. Um, and I say that only to say that uh, his family does have uh, a special place with respect to his legacy. So when people talk about Martin Luther King and Reverend Barber, uh, I want to add that uh, if there were no Martin Luther King, and of course, there was, and he stays with us in his legacy. But if there were no Martin Luther King, Reverend Barber would still be blazing the trail that he is blazing. He is one of the great 
civil rights leaders and activists of our time. And when you see greatness up close, most people can't recognize it. It's like being in a museum and being close up on a great work of art. You stand this close to it, you can't really see it. You have to step back and have perspective. I think that's the same thing with respect to people who we remember as great. Well, I don't want to remember Reverend Barber because he's alive right now. He's struggling right now. He's pursuing the legacy uh, of fighting for racial and economic justice right now. Uh, he is here at a time in which many Americans are lost, uh, fearful, not only in North Carolina, but in Washington, D.C. and around the country. This is an extraordinarily dangerous time in which we find ourselves. And so I, for one, am grateful for his courage and leadership and the fact that he's taking up the mantle of Dr. King's work right where he left it. Uh, with respect to his plans to go back to Washington to lead a poor people's campaign, exactly what Dr. King was planning at the time that his life was tragically you know, cut short. So let me just say one, one other thing before I, as they say, before I decrease so that he can increase. Most people in Martin Luther King's time didn't march with him. Most African Americans didn't march with Martin Luther King Jr. Most, maybe most, certainly many white Americans viewed him as a troublemaker, an agitator. They didn't support him. That was the reality of it. In fact, I've heard those words applied to Reverend Barber, uh, and we will hear them again. Many people, even within the Civil Rights Movement, abandoned Martin Luther King Jr. in his last years. Uh, they split with him over his opposition to the war in Vietnam. They wanted him to focus narrowly on racial discrimination and not economic injustice. Uh, that was true then. It is no doubt true now. Uh, most people weren't with him in Montgomery, Alabama, in St. Augustine, Florida, uh, in uh, Albany, Georgia, in uh, Alabama, Selma, back to Montgomery, Cicero in Chicago and Illinois, Memphis, Tennessee, at the end of his life, when he was depressed and abandoned. Most people weren't there with him. But this is our time. Uh, and we have someone whom I consider to be uh, a great leader, an advocate for the cause of racial and social justice. Reverend Barb, as you know, stepped down as the chair of the state North Carolina State NAACP, I think just this weekend. Um, and he is the national president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach. He is distinguished visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York and the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, calling for a moral revival. Uh, you know him because he has led the Moral Monday movement here in North Carolina. He has spoken truth to power, courageously, uh, even while uh, many in the legislature and elsewhere in North Carolina have tried to cow him and others who stand up for racial justice. You can join him on Twitter uh, you know, I don't do Twitter for reasons that you could guess at. Um, but he invites you to join him on Twitter at Reverend Barber II and at www.breachrepairers.org.
org. And so I encourage you to join him there also. Uh, we're honored to have him here tonight. It's appropriate, it's more than appropriate. And as I said, as I promised, um, I will decrease so he can increase uh, the Reverend William J. Barber II. 
and we won't be silent anymore. Give it up for Miss Yara Allen. She is the Theo musicologist for the Forward Together, for the Repairers of the Breach, and the National Theo musicologist for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Might we just for a moment meditate on an old Jewish text? The stone that the builders rejected will now become the chief cornerstone. Amen. It is good to be here. See, Chancellor Folk, the first woman to lead this nation's oldest public institution of higher learning, to Dr. Katz and all of the staff team of the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, and to all the true uh, blue Tar Heels <laughs> who were gracious enough to break bread today with a proud North Carolina Central University Eagle and a Duke Blue Devil. And to the Wheel family, where are you? The Wheel family, let's give it up for them. Would you just raise them? They established this lecture over a century ago. It's a great honor to be with you here this evening. I've been on the road for about six weeks straight from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Alaska, to California, to Kansas. But it's good to be here with you this evening. I have to leave early in the morning going to Chicago and Indiana. It's good to be here to remember together the legacy of this Jewish family that found its way in the 19th century to Goldsboro, North Carolina, where I live and where I've pastored for the past quarter of a century. Goldsboro, North Carolina, the place where just outside of that city in Eureka, Charles B. Acox gave one of the most racist speeches in history two years prior to the Wilmington riots. Goldsboro, the place that once was known, if you were black, for the only place where African Americans were placed in mental institutions in the state of North Carolina. In some ways, Goldsboro was considered by many, like Nazareth was considered in the Bible a place where nothing good could come out of. And yet, the wills. And like them, I have read the great prophets of Judaism as I've traveled the roads of Wayton County in North Carolina. And like their daughter and, and matriarch Gertrude, who founded the North Carolina League of Women Voters, I have felt the weight of attacks on voting rights as an assault on the image of God that is stamped on every one of them. My own Jewish teachers, my rabbis, has taught me as they have taught her that in Hebrew the word voice for voice and the word for vote are terribly similar. And so I thank you this evening for the invitation to lift my voice and thereby cast my vote in this turbulent moment for the American democracy. I want today in this lecture to talk about reviving the heart and soul of our democracy and why America needs a poor people's campaign and a national moral revival. It was in the spring, Dr. Shaw, of 1915 after in party fights with Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was demanding in that day, in 1912, he called for a moral agenda in which public education would be seen as a moral issue. Protecting the environment would be seen as a moral issue, not Democrat or Republican. That health care for everyone and a minimum wage and labor rights and getting money out of politics would all, and public education would all be seen as moral issues. That caused a lot of infighting. And former President William Howard Taft, he lost the White House in 1912. And it was Taft who gave the first wheel lecture 
on American citizenship here at the University of North Carolina. And though he was no longer in the Oval Office, President Taft did not hesitate to speak publicly about the office he had once held. The title of his lecture was The Presidency, Powers, Duties, Obligation, and Responsibilities. It would be an interesting academic exercise <laughs> to hold that century-old vision of the presidency from America's progressive area up against the state of the presidency today. But if we leap too quickly across time between now and then, we miss the main lesson that history offers us in our present moral crisis, which is this, white nationalism and fear-mongering is not new. White nationalism and white supremacy were alive and well in the progressive era. When Woodrow Wilson, a southerner, who had been the governor of New Jersey and the president of Princeton, because being educated doesn't necessarily keep someone from being a white supremacist, Woodrow Wilson ascended to the White House. White populists had gotten behind the white supremacist campaign of the extremist Democratic Party right here in North Carolina a generation earlier. They ushered in Jim Crow segregation, and the chief architect of their campaign right here in North Carolina was Fernhold Simmons. He had built a political machine to maintain white-only rule for the Democrats who paved the way for the Dixiecrats that would come in the 1950s and 60s. Gone was the public memory of the red strings, those who wore red strings to say they were like Rahab in the city of Jericho waiting for and that the redemption of the land, who they remain, the red strings remain true to the Union through the Civil War. Gone was the Reconstruction government by the mid-1900s. Gone was the African-American representation, George White being the last African-American kicked out of the United States Congress in 1900-1901. Gone was the fusion party that brought black and, black and poor whites to get North Carolinians together to build a Tar Heel state for all. Gone were those who rewrote the Constitution in North Carolina that said that everybody has a right to life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor and the pursuit of happiness and that education should be a public right and that equal protection under the law was a right for all. Gone was all of that. Gone was all of that when a former Republican president came here to deliver the first wheel lecture in 1915. North Carolina then was a one-party state, and it wasn't Taft's party, and they saw it their business to roll back every accomplishment of the Reconstruction. But the white-only Democrats of the South, who were the precursors of the Dixiecrat, were delighted to have their man in the White House, Woodrow Wilson. He'd already kicked black leadership out of his office when some of them came because they had actually voted for him, some of them, and he kicked them out of his office. He had already begun to resegregate federal offices in D.C. to finish the final deconstruction of Reconstruction. And in March of 1915, President Wilson invited his old college buddy from North Carolina, the Reverend Thomas Dixon from Shelby, North Carolina, to screen the film adaptation of his popular novel at the White House. The name of Reverend Thomas Dixon's best-selling novel was The Klansman. The film was a celebration of white supremacy rising again, birth of a nation. Now, this is 100 years before Bannon was ever in the White House. Woodrow Wilson had all of his staff watch the Klansmen. It had been the most effective tool in recruiting modern Ku Klux Klan, and it debuted with a presidential blessing. It was a lie. It was a distortion about Reconstruction and black and white fusion politics, and yet it got an okay from the highest office in the land in 1915 and 1916. And in 1919, six years after Silent Sam was raised here, 
the Lee statue was erected in Charlottesville, commissioned in 1917, but raised in 1919, and it was not to pay homage to the Civil War. It was to pay homage to white supremacy and the resurrection and reinstitution of white supremacy between 1898 and that time. And it was raised to celebrate a friend and an embodiment of white nationalism in the Oval Office. Could that be the reason why Alt-Right and Unite the Right and Richard Spencer chose that statue to have their recent hate field march that was happened in Charlottesville. My brothers and sisters, what we are seeing in America today is not new. And one of the worst things you can do is to suggest or think that it is. Donald Trump's attack on NFL players isn't about whether they respect the flags or respect our veterans. How can you call, how can, how can you call someone you disagree with an SOB and then say they are disrespectful. There's something deeper going on here. How can you disagree with kneeling? The Pope kneels. <laughs> Presbyterians kneel. <laughs> Jews kneel. Muslims kneel. Kneeling is one of the most sacred postures. How, what is it that you would disagree with kneeling? There's something deeper going on here. So don't get it twisted. Even as we have our debates about Silent Sam and the Lee statue, the question about the statues is not whether we respect the dead. The statues didn't go up out of respect for the 1,000 alumni of this university who fought on both sides of the Civil War. No, these monuments were erected nearly, were erected between 1898 and 1922 to whitewash history and to celebrate the legalization of white supremacy. In fact, Dr. Tim Tyson tells me, as we often have conversation, that 80% of them went up between the Wilmington riots and 1922 before we even had the first vote on an anti-lynching law in America. Those of us who came up in the Southern freedom struggle know that. We know that beginning in 1954, citizenship in this society was redefined by thousands of courageous men, women, and children, Jews, Gentiles, and Christians, black and white and brown, who were willing to risk life and limb to challenge white supremacy. What we usually call the Civil Rights Movement, I, I call it with the others, America's Second Reconstruction, the first being in America between 1868 and the 1990s, and this second one between 1954 and 1968. It lasted about 13 years until its institution and leaderships were assassinated and fractured and because of co-entail and other ways of breaking the movement. The movement did not achieve all that it desired, but the backlash against it has deconstructed much of the good it was able to achieve. And I want to pause here to measure the time between the ascension of white supremacy to the White House in 1915 and the emergence of a resistance that affected political and legislative change in this nation. Between birth of a nation and the Brown decision, we suffered 40 years, 40 long years in the wilderness. The fundamental questions that American democracy faced in 1915 are the same questions we face now. When these lectures were first found, do we have a government that represents all Americans? Can we reconstruct a system founded on white supremacy and plantation capitalism and genocide? Is it possible to live up to our promise of liberty and justice for all? Is it possible to be indivisible? We cannot watch a foot game, football game without facing these questions today. You can't read about a U.S. Attorney General refusing to defend voting rights, attacking immigrants, and attacking affirmative action at, at the behest of the president without seriously asking yourself, is America possible? In 2017, we faced the same fundamental questions we faced in 1915, but we cannot in our present crisis afford to wander Another 40 years in the wilderness. The fierce urgency of now is not so much about Donald Trump. Trump is a symptom. 
Even if he had not gotten elected, we would still have to face these questions. But he certainly is exacerbating the need to face them. The world has endured narcissistic fear mongers before. More to the point, however, we can't afford to wait because the forces that brought Trump to power threatened to upend the very notion of democracy and destroy the earth itself. For as late as today, the conversation is being raised. How can we have more nuclear weapons? But what is also an issue for us is that some of our public leadership has demonstrated that they have no capacity to fully name and resist these disastrous forces. Case in point, <clears throat> Senator Bob Corker can tell the New York Times that he and every senator knows Trump needs a babysitter. That's what he said. He said that he, that, that he, is, and he is dangerous in the way in which he moves and breathes and acts as president. But those same senators cannot muster any real resistance to the white nationalist agenda, the attack on immigrants, the sabotage of health care, the suppressing of voting rights, the bloating of defense spending, and unchecked fossil fuel extraction. Where, if, if Trump is so much a problem now, wasn't he a problem when he lifted up the lie about birtherism? Where was Croker and the critics when Trump signed the Muslim ban? How quick Lindsey Graham goes from a critic to a golf partner? Where, was, where were they? Where are these voices when the health care for 30 million Americans was on the chopping block? And we were about to take more, 140 times more money from the backs of poor people than were taken during slavery. You know, in 1960, the price tags on slaves was $5 million, $5 billion. We were about to take $600 billion and turn it over to the wealthy. That's 140 more times in terms of money than the price tag of slaves in 1860. Where were they? Where were they? Where was he when, when, when a Congress wanted to, to want, wants to cut taxes and recommend at the same time an $85 billion increase in military spending? Where are these voices? Could it be that they are not really in disagreement with the narcissist? They simply are in disagreement with the style and not the substance. What we face, therefore, is not simply a political problem. It's not a left problem. It's not a right problem. It's a heart problem. It's a moral malady. The very heart and soul of our democracy is at stake. And if we are to understand this current crisis of citizenship in America, we must pay attention to five diseases that threaten the heart of our common life. Why do I say diseases? Because the issue is so much bigger than Democrat versus Republican. In fact, that language, left versus right, is too puny. Conservative versus liberal. I'm left-handed and I'm right-handed. <laughs> left and right comes from the French Revolution. When those on the left wanted to, didn't want the monarch and those on the right did, that's not where we are. I'm conservative and I'm liberal. I want to conserve justice. I want to liberally spread it to everybody. So that language is too puny. Some issues, some issues are not about leak left and right. They do not have equal moral standing. Some issues are about right versus wrong, period. It is about whether we will be human beings or whether we will prey on one another. What we face today just as in the period between 1898 and 1922, is whether we can be a government of, by, and for the people. That's the question. It is about whether we are serious about our Constitution's moral vision of we the people. Our Constitution's moral vision that we have to repent and recognize that we've not yet become a perfect nation, so we still have work to do. It is about our Constitution's moral vision that says before you wave the flag and before you, 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 you pass this freedom on to other people, you must establish justice. You must provide for the common defense. You must promote the general welfare. You must ensure domestic tranquility. And then you have a liberty worthy of being passed on to the generations 
that come behind you and your posterity. Will our policies and citizenship strive toward this goal is the question. Or will we settle for a political and social life based on who hates who? That is the question. Will we uphold the great and universal moral principles of religion for every nation since every politician likes to brag about how they put their hand on the Bible and swear into office? Well, the great principle, universal moral principles that every religion teaches for a nation to be successful is that that nation must be rooted in love and justice and mercy and grace and care for the poor and care for the immigrant and the sick and the broken and the battered? Or will we simply see the survival of the fittest, greed, isolation, and xenophobia, and racism be our guide? Our answer, I believe, is rooted in how we address, how we diagnose, and how we face five deep threats to our democracy. Now, the first deep threat and disease we must face is systemic racism. You cannot understand American history without understanding the original sin of racism and genocide. Since the rejection election of 2016, when white rage, as Carol Anderson says, propelled the candidate who was endorsed by the KKK to the Republican National Convention and who stood there and, and committed the sin of idolatry, when he said, I and I alone can fix this. My Jewish friends would know that sound like Nebuchadnezzar, somebody, you know, <laughs> Pharaoh. I and I alone. Race since that election and even before has been ever before us. But our national conversation about racism has become confused. And you see it best in the post-Charlottesville debates about whether there were good people on both sides. Every politician in America that had some sense condemned hate after Charlottesville. Only the president, for the most part, stuttered. But racism, you can condemn hate and still be for white supremacy and white nationalism. Racism is not just about hate, interpersonal hate. Did you hear Richard Spencer when he went back to Charlottesville last week? We come peacefully and we'll come again, he said. Racism also isn't about whether you have a black friend or a black student in class. <laughs> or a black assistant vice president. Racism isn't, isn't also isn't just about whether or not you use the N-word. Institutional racism is written into policy. It is about power. After the civil rights movement, white people who were afraid of losing power learn how to perpetuate the culture of racism without appearing to be racist and also learn how to get some black folk to join them because every ventriloquist can find a dummy. <laughs> and they learn how to do it though through code words and dog whistles. The Southern strategy that Kevin Phillips would, who lectured here would later repent of was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way to drive Southern whites to vote for extremist white politicians. But it also would work in some of the Northern enclaves of the North where you could pit Italians and Jews and blacks against one another and in the Midwest and in the Rust Belt. And in a starkly, starkly revealing interview, former GOP strategist Lee Atwater boldly described how the Southern strategy worked to undermine fusion type political movements because Kevin Phillips said, if you find out who hates who, you can win in American politics. Remember what he said? He said, and these are tough words, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, 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 and that'll get you elected. But by 1968, you can't say that because it'll hurt you. So you start talking about things like forced busing and states' rights and entitlements being bad. Now you're getting abstract. And then you really get abstract and talk about cutting taxes. And all these things you talk about, they don't sound racist because you don't use the N-word or you don't say you're hating. And they sound almost totally economic. But the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt percentage-wise worse than whites. And whites are taught to believe 
that their problem are black people and brown people getting things they undeserve. Dr. King said it in 65, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, he said he, had, he felt so sorry for Southern whites, many of them, because he said a rich oligarchy, when their stomachs were growling from hunger and poverty, a rich oligarchy fed them Jim Crow and turned them against the very people, black people, that they should have been in alliance with in order to fight for economic justice. Now, the target of this Southern strategy was initially the old Confederacy, because if you can control the 13 former Confederate states from Virginia all the way over to Texas, you can control 191 electoral votes, which means you only need 99 from the other 37 states. You can control 26 members of the United States Senate, which means you only need 25 more from the other 37 states to have a majority. You can control 31% of the United States House of Representatives. So the goal was to create a solid South and then work the other, and then find other states to add to that. But the South would be solid. And Southern whites, they wanted to ensure that a, that, that, that a majority of Southern whites would resist and repeal and repel any fusion alliances with African Americans because they had seen how that works in the first reconstruction of the 1800s and second reconstruction of the 1900s. But it turned out that race baiting worked in other parts of the country too. Sound familiar? In Wisconsin's Democratic primary in 1964, more than a third of the state's Democrats voted for George Wallace in Wisconsin. Hmm? Later, three weeks later, Wallace landed 30% of the votes in Indiana. And two Ku Klux Klanmen ran a shoestring campaign out of a service station phone booth. In Maryland's Democratic primary, a northern place, something really southern, but some claim it north, Wallace won 16 of the state's 23 counties. When Wallace stood in the door of the University of Alabama, he received over 100,000 congratulatory cards from the north. And he said, hmm, this race fear-mongering thing is bigger than just a southern issue. Now, Wallace, when he ran, George Wallace, the one who stood up and said segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow, February 1963, that's the George Wallace I'm talking about, the loud governor that would say anything and do anything. When he ran and got all those votes, it surprised George H.W. Bush. He saw the volcanic white opposition to the Democratic Party embrace of civil rights open the door for Republicans in the solid South. So Bush then, who had never run for an office, decided to run for the United States Senate. You know what he did? In 1964, he said, I am emphatically opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He didn't say because he hated black people. He said because it tramples upon the Constitution by mandating equal access to restaurants, hotels, restrooms, and other public accommodation. And he said to a crowd, the new Civil Rights Act was passed to protect 14% of people. I'm worried about the 86%. This is the kind of gentler white supremacy that brought Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats into the Republican Party. Strom Thurmond and them really liked George Wallace, but they knew he couldn't win. So they needed to find a kind of gentler white supremacy. It paved the way for the campaign of Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and the Bushes, all of whom employed the same political operatives and the same divide and conquer tactics. So here's what I'm trying to say, first of all. Don't let anybody tell you that the problem is just Trump. That kind of analysis is too weak. It does not deal with the, the disease of systemic racism. What we're seeing now has been 50 years in the workings. Yes, Trump embraced and emboldened white nationalists who rallied in Charlottesville and other way. Yes, they feel like they can take off their hoods and stand tall with Trump in the White House. But long before Trump mastered the con of the Southern strategy, he had an audience that had been cultivated for 50 years. And what should be fit, cause us fear or cause us concern is not that he used these tactics, but the ease at which he used these tactics, the way in which the media didn't know how to critique it, and the way in which progressives didn't know how to address it. We are seeing what Nell Painter calls the iconography of an American call and response. The call is racial progress, and simultaneously, or shortly thereafter, the response is, as Carl, Carol Anderson has aptly named it, white rage and aggression. Only with this history in mind 
Can we comprehend what Brother Coates has said so well, amplifying the analysis of our sister Nell Painter? Coates said this recently, for Trump, it almost seems that the fact of Obama, the fact of a black president insulted him personally. Replacing Obama is not enough. Trump has made the negation of Obama's legacy the foundation of its own to wipe out a history that should not be ever in America according to the white nationalist mindset. Trump truly is something new. He is the first president whose entire political existence hinges on the fact of a black president. No Obama, no Trump. And so it will not suffice to say that Trump is a white man like all others who rose to become president. He must be called by his rightful honorific, America's first white president. He is the, the perfect example of white privilege. He, everything he did, people looked the past at those who voted, not just poor whites, but all the way up the line because of this call and response that is as American as apple pie. And that is why we, we misunderstand the challenge of racism if we think it's just about a di dislike for black people. No systemic racism is a dislike of democracy. Fact, you can be black and be a white nationalist. <laughs> you can be black and embrace or encourage white nationalism and systemic re racism. 11% of people, black men, voted for Trump. You can be black and be silent and be an accessory to the crime of white nationalism because systemic racism is simply the perpetuation of a system where the ideal of whiteness and white power are the norm in our common life. It is to accept the heresy that says some people were not made in the image and likeness of God. Now, to see this up close, you, you could look at it through every lens, education, criminal justice system, the attack on immigrants. In fact, that's where Richard Spencer said he first decided that Trump was his man, was when he talked about Mexicans as rape. He said, that's my man. Because in the white nationalist mindset, the first war, if you will, is the attack on immigrants. Get them out. Get them away. But I want to look at white supremacy, white nationalism, systemic racism through the lens of voter suppression. Since the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act June 25, 2013, there has been an assault on voting rights in this country like we haven't seen since the 19th century. Let me give you some numbers. There were 868 fewer voting sites in the black and brown and poor white community in 2016. 868 fewer sites. There were there 22. That's the number of states that have passed voter suppression laws since 2010. This is six years before Trump is ever running. 22 states that represent 44 senators and nearly 50% of the House of State, House of the United States House of Representatives, and over 54% of African American voters. Four years, four years. That's how long it's been since the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, now let me help us understand that. Strom Thurmond only filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 57 for 24 hours. This Congress, before Trump, under McConnell and Ryan, have filibustered fixing the Voting Rights Act for four years. That is over a thousand days, a thousand day filibuster, which means sitting here right now, we have less voting rights than we had August 6, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was first passed. And we talk about Trump winning Wisconsin by 20 or 30,000 votes. There were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin. In North Carolina, we won, we beat the voter suppression. We beat them on gerrymandering, and still they were able to find a way to, 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 to take away 150 fewer voting sites during early voting. This election hacking, this is the election hacking that no one really wants to talk about because it would force us to deal with systemic racism. And America wants to always kind of deal with racism as those folk, the David Dukes or the people with the torches. And we don't want to really deal with systemic racism. I don't know how much help Trump got from Russia. He did, but I don't know how much. But it's manifestly clear that he could not have stolen the election 
without the help of systemic racism and voter suppression. And whether their tactics are partisan gerrymandering, a discriminatory extreme voter ID requirement, or rolling back early voting and same day uh, registration, or not allowing 16 and 17 year olds to vote, the places where we see an attack on voting rights in America are the same places where we see the highest poverty levels. As I'm traveling around the country, we're making that point because some people think voting rights is a black issue, voting rights is an American issue, voting rights is a poverty issue, voting rights is a union issue because the same states, if you put them up on a map, that suppress the vote also have, the, have a lack of living wage and the highest levels of poverty and the greatest attacks on the immigrant community and the greatest attacks on the LGBT community and the greatest lack of funding of public education. Wherever you find racist voter suppression, all of these things follow. And politicians who use surgical and targeted racist voter suppression, they use that racialized methodology to get elected. And then once they get elected, they use their power to promote and codify policies that hurt all Americans, especially poor and working class white people. And poor and working class brown people and black people and their policies only benefit a greedy oligarch. White nationalists don't care about white people because they don't care about democracy. Hmm. And so we have to make the connection between these maladies that threaten the very heart of our democracy. And when somebody says, well, I don't agree with the white nationalists, I'm not a white supremacist, you say, okay, but let's do this. Let's go on the website of the white nationalists and look at their policies. A white nationalist vote against the Voting Rights Act and refuse to, to deal with voter suppression. Where do you vote, Mr. Politician? I'm not saying you're white supremacist. I'm just saying. White nationalists are anti-immigrant. Where are you, Mr. Politician? Huh? Where are you? Have you where, how do you vote on immigration? White nationalists don't believe in a living wage for everybody. Trump said the living wage is too high. The people in his party will not vote for a living wage. I'm just saying. White nationalists are against health care for everybody. Mr. Mr. Politician, where are you against for universal health care? White nationalism loves to, uh, 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 against native people having a right to their land. Mr. Politician, where are you? White nationalists believe in war and warmongering, particularly with a mindset rooted in past genocide, and especially when that war is going to be targeted primarily at black and brown people. Mr. Politician, where are you? I'm not saying you're a white supremacist. I'm just saying that if you vote with the white supremacists and you support the policies that's on their Google pages, my grandmother used to say, if you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck, you must be a duck. And that is the way we separate the conversation from talking about white people to talking about white supremacists. And that's why I can even say that same thing to a black politician, because if that black politician votes the same uh, policies of white supremacy, then that black person is at best an enabler of white supremacy. Hmm. The second disease we have to deal with also, though, is unjust and immoral attacks on the poor. Oh, in the richest nation in the history of the world, we do not like to talk about the fact that a third of our population is crippled by poverty. Republicans blame the poor often for their plight, while Democrats insist on talking about those who strive to enter into the middle class, as though they can't even say the word poor. But some people are just poor. In fact, they're poor, as my grandmama used to say. Over 102, 110 million people. They're actually, Dr. King one time talked about two Americas. There are four Americas. There's the wealthy. There's the struggling middle class. There's the working poor. There's five. There's the poor. And then there's just the extreme poor and homeless. Hmm? Former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich says, the ranks of the working poor are growing because wages at the bottom have dropped and adjusted for inflation with increasing numbers of Americans taking low-paying jobs in retail, sales, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, child care, elder care, and other personnel services. They pay the pay of the bottom fifth 
is falling closer to the minimum wage. At the same time, the real value of the federal minimum wage is lower than it was 25 years ago. In fact, if the minimum wage had kept up with the pace of inflation, it would be nearly $20 an hour. We have 14 million people, children in poverty 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And Mary Wright Edelman tells us if you took 2% of the federal government and spent it on programs that worked, we could e uh, alleviate 60% of that poverty tomorrow. The question is not do we have the resources, it is do we have the will. In the U.S., we claim to be the leader of the free world, but we pay half of African-American workers and 60% of Latino workers less than $15 an hour. There's 64 million people making less than $15 an hour. Down here in the South, where politicians still pit white workers against workers of color, 50% of all workers make less than $15 an hour. All workers, all workers. And over the past five years, cities where Fight for 15 has won living wage and campaign, then the state legislatures intervened to override the municipalities. The very people that claim they want local control, they want it on everything but living wages. Hmm? The state legislature in Missouri, you remember Ferguson? just voted this year to take their minimum wage backwards. Meanwhile, the economic growth America has seen in the Great Recession has benefited the wealthiest member. And it's not wealthy, just but there's some folk that are wealthy and kind. There are others that are greedy. Greedy corporate criminals on Wall Street got bailouts while working Americans, working jobs were shipped, were shipped overseas or outsourced to contractors and in the 21st century, the divide between the rich and the poor in this country has grown exponentially. In some ways, it's worse than the Great Depression. The top 0.1% of income earners in America today make 198 times more than the bottom 90%. 400 families, according to Joseph Stickley, the Nobel Peace Prize economist, I had a chance to sit with him for a couple of hours and working on the Poor People's Campaign, and he reminded me that 400 families in this country make an average of $97,000 an hour while we are arresting people and locking them up who simply want 15 in a union. Since last year's rejection election, pundits have returned again to the plight of the so-called white working class. Tired of watching their neighbors die of opioid overdoses, white people who voted for Obama in 2012 flipped to Trump in 2016, some suggested. With growing income inequality, the theory was that white people felt desperate. But other people have felt desperate throughout history and did not vote for a narcissistic egomaniac. <laughs> but, on, but if you look at closer examination, this theory doesn't pan out because white people voted overwhelmingly for Trump across every income level. It's not just about white working class. And as, as happened so often in our history, race was used in 2016 to pit poor white people against poor black people and brown people. Remember when Trump went to a, an all-white audience to talk about black poverty? Yeah. And, other, and, and there was a, there's, a, there's something he was doing that goes as far back as W.B. Du Bois when W.B. Du Bois said there are some people that see certain people as not just people who have problems but are problem people. So he went before an all-white audience to talk about black poverty to basically say they are a problem people. Look again at the maps of the United States. Nine out of ten America's poorest counties are so-called red, red, excuse me, nine out of ten America's poorest states are so-called red states. So-called working class whites in raw numbers hurt the most from the economic injustice that is perpetrated by tax cuts, deregulation, and denial of federal assistance. In fact, North Carolina couldn't even run if you took away federal assistance. And yet people rail against it. Somebody has to tell poor white people and poor black people and poor brown people, regardless of your color, if you can't pay your light bill and your lights go out, we are all terribly black in the dark. Is it race or is it class, people ask? Yes, it's race and class. We've seen it right here in North Carolina with a vote from none other than Clarence Thomas, the Robert Courts, found that our legislature target African Americans with nearly surgical precision when it passed the monster voter suppression law in 2013. That was systemic racism. But their systemic racism that allowed them to hold on to a supermajority has hurt more poor white people than any group in this state. 
When this legislature denies Medicaid expansion, 346,000 of the people that would get Medicaid expansion are white. A thousand people in Mitchell County, North Carolina, that's 89%, 99% white, 89% Republican. This legislature has voted against increased wages, voted against the extension of federal unemployment benefits, and even against the earned income tax credit. And when you vote against the earned income tax credit that even Ronald Reagan says good, when you make Ronald Reagan look like a liberal, my goodness. <laughs> but racism and classism mixed to make a poisonous concoction. And with our political leadership drunk on this tonic, the whole world suffers and our democracy suffers. The third disease we have to face is ecological devastation. Mm, it threatens the heart and soul of our democracy. We do not have to look far these days but to see that the earth is sick. Harvey hit Houston, Irma hit Florida, Maria hit Puerto Rico so fast that most of us could holler follow the floods in Asia that kill thousands, the earthquakes in Mexico and Central America, and the forest fires that continue to rage on the West Coast. All of this in the past two months alone, sometimes we call these natural disasters, but maybe there's nothing natural about the rate at which we are experiencing the upheaval in our world. Between 1970 and 1979, meteorologists recorded 660 disasters around the world. Between 2000 and 2009, the last decade on record, there were 3,322. In between, in the 1990s, climate scientists testified before Congress and explained to the public that two centuries of fossil fuel extraction had not only built a global economy, but had released enough carbon into the atmosphere that the planet Earth had a fever. Now, then, it was a slight fever, about a half of a degree Celsius. You know, the kind of fever mama used to give you some chicken soup and send you on off to school or off to bed. But no one knew exactly how a planet would respond. And now we've passed one degree Celsius, and it's clear that we don't just have a fever, we have a sickness. And greed, 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 greed is causing even more of this. In addition to this, people like those in Flint, Michigan, think about it. You can buy unleaded gas, but you can't get unleaded water. And less than a few miles from the road, uh, uh, Nestle's is allowed to bottle 100,000 bottles of water for something like $2. And the people in Flint can't get clean water. Water has been weaponized in far too many communities. Multinational corporations are drilling for gas, penetrating the aquifers on Apache land. I was just in Arizona with the Apache Nation. Cold ash is being spilt in our rivers and poisoning our wells. Pipelines are being constructed, not only through Standing Rock, but also being planned right through eastern North Carolina. Deregulation is reopening coal mines in Alaska. I was just there with the native people of Alaska that will devastate the environment and native land. And meanwhile, the robber barons who have taken control of the federal government have pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, done everything in their power to bring back coal and make way for new and dangerous fossil fuel pipelines. Then there's a fourth sickness we must face, and that is the war economy. President Eisenhower, the general turned commander in chief, warned of a military co industrial complex. You remember when he was leaving office after General Motors and American Steel had seen boost in profits that came from both destroying and rebuilding Europe after World War II, Eisenhower said we better be careful to keep American investors out of the business of war. In Vietnam, taught Americans to be conscious. The founding father, James Madison, said, no nation could reserve its freedom in the midst of continual war. The quagmire of Southeast Asia's jungles brought his word of caution to full force. Congress passed the War Powers Act of 1973 as a permanent check on America's war making. But this restraint could not endure the Reagan years. The Gipper who had played a soldier on America's TV screen, knew how nothing unites a nation like a common enemy. His Star Wars ballooned the defense budget, even as Congress passed tax cuts that were supposed to grow the economy. During the Reagan-Bush years, the federal debt quadrupled, but our addiction to war making was, is nonpartisan. It continued during the Clinton years as the Department of Defense honed its capacity to make perpetual war on multiple fronts by outsourcing non-combatant operations. We used to call those mercenaries. 
to private companies. They were more contractors on the ground in Bosnia than U.S. troops. Bush, too, seized upon 9-11 as an opportunity to declare war without end on one of the war's chief products, namely terror. In the name of national security, the Obama administration transformed the CIA into a covert offensive arm of military operations, carrying out hundreds of unarmed drone attacks around the world, and without any public ac accountability as to who was targeted, who was written off as collateral damage and at what cost. Yes, it is disturbing to consider now that with all of this war machinery, thumbs which tweet spitefully against partisan allies have the capacity to type nuclear codes for an arsenal that could destroy the world several times over, and he's asking for more. But the madness of the current escalation between the U.S. and North Korea is simply the latest chapter. It's not new, it's the latest chapter in a long story of a war economy hell-bent on a limitless growth, and we have to face it. The 2017 military budget is almost $600 billion, which doesn't include veterans care, $182 billion, the nuclear arsenal, $20 billion. And so for 54 cents of every discretionary dollar paid in the federal taxes goes to the military. Not to health care, not to education, not to jobs, not to infrastructure, not to a war on poverty. After dropping the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan and threatening war with North Korea, Trump now wants an additional $54 billion for the military in 218. But the so-called warmongers, so-called conservatives, warmongers in Congress said, no, that's not enough. We want $85 billion. If we were just to cut $1 billion from our bloated military budget, we could pay for 12,000 elementary school teachers, 17,000 infrastructure jobs, 112,000 head stop slots for children, and 96,000 veterans could receive comprehensive medical care. We've spent $3 trillion and growing on the war in Iraq. $3 trillion. We argue that we do not have the resources, that the resources are scarce. No, that's not what scares. What scares is our moral capacity to face what ails this democracy. And then finally, the fifth disease, and it pains me to say this, is while we're faced with the five, fourfold attack of racism, poverty, ecological devastation, and militarism, I would love to be able to stand here, the preacher in me, and hope that America, not only the NFL, would fall on its knees, cry out to God for help, get up from our knees, and work for justice. But much of the religion in our public life has contributed to the moral crisis we now face. And we must add to our list of maladies the fifth disease that threatens the heart and soul of our democracy, namely Christian nationalism. Or what my former professor, C. Eric Lincoln, called Americanity. Earlier this year when I saw a picture of preachers laying hand on Donald Trump in the Oval Office, I was so troubled, I wrote an open letter to my fellow clergy, and not because I'm against praying for a president, but because I know that in the scriptures, the prophets did not go to just pray for, for the kings, they went to challenge them. Those who follow Jesus challenge Caesar, they do not merely accommodate Caesar. And I said that as I watched them praising Trump praising the prophetic legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, of which he knows nothing about. And I watched them, and it showed them laying hands. First of all, the scripture says, be careful who, that who you lay hands on suddenly, lest you become a party to their sins. That's 1 Timothy 5.22. And then I thought, we cannot simply pray, P-R-A-Y, over politicians or anyone while they pray, P-R-E-Y, on the poor and the vulnerable and the sick. The teachings of Jesus are clear, the teachings of the prophets are clear, the teachings in even Islam are clear that the nation must care for the poor and the sick and the vulnerable and the hurting. And if we pray over persons engaging in injustice and do not challenge them, then we actually engage in a form of heresy. And, almost, and so many of the so-called religious right, I don't call them religious right, 
So many of these extremists who have tried to hijack the faith wrote articles saying that I was wrong and others were wrong. We're not wrong. We're not wrong. You ought to read what Kevin Cruz, who was at Princeton University, has said, and you'll understand why there's this core of religionists who fawn, who just fall out and fall down and bow down to somebody just because they have money and power. It was Kevin Cruz that did an examination of what some have called so-called white evangelism, which is not a theological term. There's no such thing as white evangelism. That's a term that Jim Wallace said people come up with. It's a euphemism that really means mostly angry white men, but that's another story. <laughs> he, says, he says, this whole public religiosity that wraps itself in the flag while doing the bidding of big business was purchased. He tells the story how in 1935, the corporations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Sun Oil, and General Motors, and, and U.S. manufacturers hated the New Deal under Roosevelt. They hated any restrictions on labor. They hated minimum wage. They hated Social Security. But they didn't have the moral credibility to challenge it because they had run the country into a depression. So they did a poll and they found, they asked who had the, the biggest and the strongest moral uh, capacity and credibility. And the poll came back and said preachers. But the problem was during that period of time, the social gospel was so powerful. Preachers who were preaching the social gospel. And, 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 and that social gospel like Walter Rauschenbusch and, 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 and others that raised the question, what would Jesus do in the face of so much injustice? And so the poll said, you got to find out a way if you want to do anything to take over these pulpits. So they hired a guy by the name of James Fifield from California, Los Angeles. And he created something called the spiritual mobilization. And all these corporations got together and paid him to go out and, and buy pulpits. Hmm, it's in the book. Buy pulpits. But in order for them to receive this money, they had to preach a twisted form of Calvinism which goes like this. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. If you're a good American, you'll prosper. If you're a bad American, you'll be poor. And then they prescribed what good was. Being for the flag, being against homosexuality, being for prayer in the school, being against abortion, you know, being for states' right. That was good, according to that. They basically tried to say that Jesus was against the gay people, against poor, poor people, uh, against, against um, those who commit abortion, he, he was for property rights, and Jesus was an original founder of the NRA. That's basically what they were trying to do. Okay. And, 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 and in, inside of 10 years, he had 19,000 pulpits that had committed to this. And if you follow that line, it traces all the way back to the magicians of Pharaoh versus, versus the prophet Moses. It goes all the way back to the false prophets that challenged Jeremiah and Isaiah. It goes all the way back to the hypocrisy of, the fact of others that challenge Jesus. It goes all the way back to the slave masters, preachers who preached slavery and did not preach deliverance. And it doesn't fit the scriptures, for the scriptures are clear. Our moral principles are clear what we're supposed to do in the face of economic challenges and racial challenges in the nation. Ezekiel 22 said, your political leaders are like wolves who tear apart their victims. They destroy people's lives for money. But in here is the worst thing. Your preachers cover up for them and tell false visions that God has said when God has not said a thing. Or Jeremiah 22 where it says to preachers, to prophets, to moral agents, go to the royal palace, deliver this message, tell the king, if you want to be a, known as a great king in God's sight, then attend to justice. Set things right between people. Rescue victims from their exploiters. Don't take advantage of the immigrant. Protect the organ, protect the widows, and stop murdering people. And then Jesus, that Palestinian, brown-skinned Palestinian Jew that I follow, that rabbi I follow, he said, the good, the gospel, true evangelicalism is first good news to the poor. In Greek, the potokos, those who've been made poor because of economic exploitation. Then he said, you got to care for the brokenhearted and the sick 
and the blind and the imprisoned. And then he said, everybody who's been made to feel unacceptable. So evangelicalism, biblical evangelism, starts with a critique of systems of injustice. And if it does not start there, if it's just about personal faith and private religion, it is not the deep moral religion of the faith that we faith that so many hold dear. It is a form of heresy. And it is a heretical attempt to hijack the faith and use it in the service of domination and oppression. A faith that says nothing and let alone does nothing when people are treated like things and corporations are treated like people is hypocritical and her heretical. It is a theological malpractice to say that the only issues to be a moral person is to be against gays, against Muslims, against abortion, against Jews, uh, for prayer in the school, for property rights. Only the faith that descended from the slaveholder religion could be so loud on those things and yet so quiet about racism, so quiet about the attacks on immigrants, so quiet about health care, so quiet about a living wages. And we can't diagnose this sickness that is affecting the soul and heart of our American property. Um, by our democracy without admitting that we have a moral problem that goes all the way down to the heart of our public religion. Well now, any good doctor once you diagnose has to give a prescription. Is there a prescription? I believe because of this, all is not lost. In fact, this means that America, for the reviving of the soul and heart of America, America needs a poor people's campaign and a, and a national call for a moral revival. Why? Because first of all, we need moral analysis that does not simply follow the talking points and the talking heads of our time, but digs deep into our national psyche. It's why we need spaces like this to tell the truth about our history. We need a moral movement to revive the heart of our democracy. That, 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 rem that reminds us that our nation has always struggled and there have always been those who would struggle to fight to make it better and that many of them faced greater struggles than we face now and we must know in this moral analysis that these forces are not new but then number two we must also have moral dissent because our deepest faith and our deepest constitutional traditions have been hijacked too often to serve greed, racism, and lies. We must raise our voices like the prophets. Silence now is not an option. We must cry out. We must cry loud. None of us can be silent. And we cannot, for instance, certify elections where the loser has three more million more votes than the victor. No, we must maintain our right to dissent. Moral dissent is a necessity in this moment. We can never say it's all right. We can never normalize it. We can never say it's all right for senators and Congress people who get health care paid for, the pe for by the people and then block not just the Affordable Care Act, but block universal health care for all Americans. Some things are just wrong, and our moral dissent must be raised. And we cannot allow any human being to deny, be denied equal protection under the law. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, is not the greatest amendment. The First Amendment, the right to free speech, and then the amendments that saved our Constitution. The 13th Amendment that ended slavery. The 14th Amendment that provided equal protection under the law. The 15th Amendment that said you cannot deny and abridge the right to vote. The 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. And the 26th Amendment that said if you're old enough to go to war, you ought to be old enough to vote on those who send you to war. We cannot, we cannot allow any human being to be denied equal protection under law because of their race, their creed, their color, or their sexuality. We must declare some things are simply non-negotiable. And we will never say that a super majority or even a simple majority of any party has the right to run roughshod over the Constitution or the higher moral laws of the universe. We must never allow hate 
to have the stage without lifting up the demands of love as a direct challenge to every hateful effort we see. No matter who's in power, no matter who's in power, touch your neighbor and say, no matter who's in power, it is our time to pick up the tradition of moral dissent like Henry David Thoreau, when he was asked would he repent of civil disobedience, he said no. I will, what, the only thing I will repent of is for not asking sooner what demon possessed me to be quiet so long. We must pick up moral dissent and have what Dr. King said, an eternal dissatisfaction with hate and militarism and poverty. We must declare like Coretta Scott King when she said violence is not just killing my husband. Violence is not uh, making sure children have public education. Violence is denying a living wage. Violence is not giving people health care. Violence is taking away people's culture. Violence is attacking immigrants. And then she said there's another form of violence and that is an apathy pathetic attitude that refuses to stand up and make a difference. We must accept the matter now of being the kind. Somebody asked me the other day, are you tired? I said, yeah, like Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Fannie Lou Hamer's 100th birthday was just this past Friday, and she said, if I die and if I fall, I'm falling five foot three inch forward, but I'm never going backwards. It is our day. Henry Thoreau is dead, Martin Luther King is dead, Coretta is dead, Dorothy Day is dead, Rabbi Heschel is dead, Fannie Lou Hamer is dead, Dorothy Day are dead, but we are alive and we are their children and it is time for us to raise our moral descent. And not only must we have moral analysis, and not only must we have moral descent, we must have moral or moral articulation, I call it, in moral descent, we must have moral activism. Not just analysis, not just articulation, but we must also disrupt what is disruptive. But not with hate, with revolutionary love. We must love this nation enough to take a knee, maybe in the halls of Congress, the streets in front of the White House, state legislatures, we must love it enough to stand between the ICE agent who has been ordered to do wrong and the immigrant neighbor who wants to do right. We must love our democracy enough to go to jail for it, the nonviolent civil disobedience to sue for it in the court and to register everybody you know to vote for it at the ballot box. No, we don't have to be in despair. We know what works. How did people turn back the white nationalism and white supremacy of the early 20th century. In the middle of that century, building on years of planning and pushing, they came together and they forged a modern day civil rights movement and a justice movement. That's how they beat it back, to take on racism, poverty, and war. They came together, black and white and brown and young and old and gay and straight and Christian and Catholic and Gentile and civil rights and labor. We must do that now. That, that is why as the national president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, I have accepted an invitation to join and help lead the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. It's time for a moral movement across this nation, in multiple states, and in the District of Columbia that, will it, that engages in indigenously-led grassroots organizing that uses moral language to frame and critique policy regardless of who's in power, that will demonstrate a commitment to civil disobedience that follows the steps of nonviolent action, that will build a stage from which to lift the voices of everyday people impacted by immoral policies, that will recognize the centrality of race, America's uh, uh, original sin, and how it connects to classism and all the other isms, that will build a broad, diverse coalition, including moral and religious leaders of all faith, a movement that will intentionally diversify the movement with the love goal of winning unlikely allies and even redeeming some of our adversaries, 
a movement that will build transformative long-term coalition race relationships, not just a rally, but a campaign, a movement that doesn't judge its success only by electoral outcomes at first, a movement that will make a serious commitment to academic and empirical analysis of policies, a movement that will use every form of social media, a video, text, Twitter, Facebook, because if Harriet Tubman got 500 slaves out of slavery and she didn't have email, she didn't have Twitter, she didn't have Google, all she had was moss on the north side of a tree, a north star in the sky, and a pistol in her pocket just in case anybody wanted to go back. We need a movement that will pursue a strong legal strategy and will pick up our Constitution and dust it off and say no matter who's in office, they don't have a right to run roughshod over the Constitution. We need a movement that will engage resistance cultural arts everywhere in every state. And we need a movement that will resist the one moment mentality and will build a campaign. We must use our moral activism to fight for a moral agenda. We cannot say this is the era of Trump. I'm a person of faith. I don't give anybody errors but God. Every error belongs to God. We are God's creation and we must stand up in this time. We must lift up. We must defend the most sacred principles of faith and constitutional values. What are those? We must fight for a pro-labor, anti-poverty, anti-racist policy that build up economic democracy through full employment. We must fight for living wages. We must fight for the alleviation of disparate unemployment. We must fight for a transition away from fossil fuels. We must fight for labor rights and affordable housing and, and social safety nets for the poor. We must fight for fair policies for immigrants in a country of immigrants. And we must critique the policies around warmongering that undermine our moral standing in the world. We must fight for equality in education by assuring that every child receives a high quality, well-funded, constitutionally diverse public education as well as access to community college and universities. We, we must fight for health care ensure Medicare, ensure Social Security, ensure Medicaid, and we must fight not just to save the Affordable Care Act, we must fight for universal health care for everybody as a, human, as a fundamental right for every human being. We must fight for fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the inequalities in that system for black, brown, and poor white people. We must fight the proliferation of guns. We must fight for it and we must fight for and fight to expand voting rights. We must save the rules we have, but then we must say it is wrong not to have automatic registration at 18. If I'm automatically registered for the war, out of me automatically registered, registered to vote. We must fight for women's rights. We must fight for LGBTQ rights. We must fight for labor rights. We must fight for immigration rights. And we must declare that we will never give up on the principle of equal protection under the law. So what are we doing right now? We are preparing to launch the fight. In 2018, with 40 days of action in 25 states and the District of Columbia, from Mother's Day to the summer solstice, I can't tell you all about it just yet because we're going to announce it later, but let me just give you a little bit. First, we have an audit being done called the Souls of Poor Folk, auditing America 50 years after the Poor People's Campaign, focusing on racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and focusing on our national morality, which are all inextricably tied together as an assault on the heart of our democracy. Who's sitting in that room? Economists? Poor people, people who work on behalf of the poor, theologians, history, they're all in the room right now working on this major audit because, as you know, the worst thing you want to be is loud and wrong. So the first thing, we got to get an audit. we got to prepare for the campaign. And we must come together. Think about it. 40 days of simultaneous actions never happened in American history. 40 days of civil disobedience in 25 state capitals and in the office of Ryan and McConnell in the Congressman, led by the poor, led with the poor. Not just one, not a commemoration, not a commem we don't need another commemoration of what Dr. King did then, another commemoration of the, of the, of the march from the No, we need a re-inauguration. We need a consecration. We need a commitment. And, and all, asking all of those that have, have been rejected, 
Huh? Reject. If you felt rejected because of poverty, rejected because of you, the, the lack of health care, rejected because of your sexuality, rejected because of race, we're calling all of you, all of you. And what would happen if for 40 days, we, 40 days out of 365 days, progressives could come together? You know, if we can't come together for 40 days, then the extremists really don't have the problem. And what if we could come together? And what if in simultaneously it would sound like this? Let's just say the Tuesday after Mother's Day, breaking news. CNN, 150, 200 people have just gone into the Mississippi State Legislature and they've taken a knee, they've sat down, and they're fighting for policy that, would wait a minute, the same thing is happening in Alabama. Hold on. We're just getting another message that is happening in uh, Virginia. Wait a minute. It's also happening in Wisconsin. Oh, oh, Ohio. Wait a minute. There are 250 in McConnell's office. There are 250 in Ryan's office. You know what they're singing? Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. What if, what if we were to do that together? Not to, to just for 40 days, but to launch a movement. Mother's Day, birth, June 25th, the summer solstice. What if we would birth light? And what if we could organize a thousand people in 25 states that would do civil disobedience? That's 25,000 plus 2,500 in the District of Columbia. There has never in the history of this country been 30,000 people that engaged in simultaneous disobedience, civil disobedience. And I think we could break through the tweets if we do that. I think we could change the news cycle if we do that. I think we might be able to inspire the 100 and 120 poor and working poor people to say, wait a minute. You know, there's a scripture in Isaiah the way God asked God, Isaiah asked God, if I go out and do this, how many people will listen to me? God said 10%. And he said, that's all. He said, that's all you need because 10% a remnant can change the whole world. I believe my Jewish friend, just maybe that valley of dry bones, those people over in Ezekiel, that valley of dry bones, maybe we can get them together. And if we get them together, we can begin a movement, not just for another election, not just to save a party, not just to 2020, but we need to look 10, 15, 20 years, a movement that will save the heart and soul of this democracy. And so I go back where I began. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. I believe that if the stones in this nation come together, we can shift the moral narrative and we can bring up a third reconstruction and we can revive the heart and the soul of this nation. We have to try, my friend. We cannot be so tired we quit. We cannot just give up because of six months of craziness. In fact, of the matter, I would rather die trying than to live and it be written on my epitaph that we gave in to oppression, we gave in to racism, we gave in to hate. If I was at my church, I'd ask, do I have a witness? When the stones that have been rejected come together, Something powerful can happen. I know the power of coming together. I know it biblically. Can I, can I just be a southern preacher for 10 minutes and I'm through? I know the power of getting together. Because when Moses and his people and his rod came together, Pharaoh came down and the Red Sea had to open up. When Esther and her uncle Mordecai came together, they were able to stop the plots of destruction against the Jewish people. When David and his rock and his slingshot and his faith came together on the battlefield, Goliath fell. And they tell me that the next day in the Jerusalem News and Observer, it read, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got together, way down in the fiery furnace, God cooled the fire in the furnace. And somebody said they saw a fourth person standing with them. And when they came out, the evil narcissistic king was bowing to their God rather than them bowing to the, his God because they told him bowing down is not an option. When the disciples of Jesus came together on Pentecost and got on one accord, God's spirit filled them. And together they became a power that stood against the idolatry of Caesar and the oppression of Rome. I know what coming together biblically does, but I also know what coming together has done historically. The truth is, when you hold on to truth and hold on to justice, justice has never lost. Truth has never lost. You're looking at me funny. I didn't say justice hadn't been fought. I didn't say truth hadn't been beat up, but it's never lost. During slavery, it looked like justice had lost. 
But when Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and, and, and Quakers and white evan and evangelicals of that day got together, they formed a fusion movement and that brought about abolition and slavery came down. Women didn't have the right to vote, but when Sojourner True and a Quaker named Lucretia Mott and others got together, women won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson, you remember that? Looked like it had the victory. But when Thurgood Marshall got white lawyers and black lawyers and Jewish lawyers all together in, in the end, an all white Supreme Court with one member who had been a, who had been a member of the KKK voted unanimously to tear down separate but equal. It looked like Jim Crow had beaten down injustice and couldn't rise again. But when Rosa Parks and Martin King and Bayard Rushton and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and Jonathan Daniels and Viola Wusa and Rabbi Heschel and Cesar Chavez and James Reed, when they all got together, they tore Jim Crow down. Apartheid looked like it was winning, but over in, uh, over in South Africa, they used to have a saying, a dying mule kicks the hardest. And when Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and the women of South Africa all got together, apartheid came tumbling down. So there's plenty of record in history that if you engage in moral analysis, if you engage in moral articulation, and if you engage in moral activism, you may have some bruises when it's all over. But when the dust clears, justice wins, love wins, truth wins. Now, you know, not only do I know it biblically, and do I, I know it historically, I, I also know that no matter how hard it gets, you have to fight. So let me tell you personally why I'm willing to fight. Not only do I know about theology, not only do I know about history, but I'm talking about what happened in my own life. Several years ago, some said I'd never walk again. They said I was crippled forever. They said I'd never get out of a wheelchair. I was 30 years old. I had always depended on my legs, but I woke up one morning. I couldn't move. I spent three months in a bed right here at UNC Hospital, not knowing if I'd ever get up again. For 12 years, I went into depression. I got really hurt. For 12 years, I was in a wheelchair, and I was on a walker. But over those 12 years, somehow, my mind got together, and then my doctors got together, and then my nurses got together, and then my father pharmacists got together, and then my swim coach got together, and my therapist got together, and the prayer warriors got together, and the mothers in the church got together, and the, my family got together, and good God almighty, I can hop now, I can walk out on stage right now, because when they all got together, things began to work out. I'm telling you, this is no time for despair. This is time for a poor people's campaign. This is time for a national call for a moral revolution. Because when we all get together, what a day, what a day, what a day, what a day of rejoicing it will be.